sulfates of 100. But sulfate has a salt index of 28. So your sulfate bringing oxygen with it in, into the surfaces of the colloid will release magnesium and it'll leave the calcium behind. Now and why, why, then why, why you is get... It, why, why is it in preference? Why is the sulfate in preference taking the magnesium and leaving the calcium behind? What's the chemistry there? That, okay, yeah. If you look at Epsom salts, yeah. that's magnesium sulfate. sulfate yeah. If you look at plaster, that's calcium, calcium sulfate. sulfate. Okay. So you know it is that way, yeah. even though yeah. the explanation of yeah. why yeah, just may be a little bit yeah. more yeah. remote. Yeah. Okay. But you okay. know it is that way. Okay. 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 That's, yeah, because... <coughs> It is interesting that, that you refer to gypsum being used. And yeah, you yeah. put the gypsum on, but you release the magnesium with the gypsum. And you shift the, the cation exchange ratio towards the calcium with that. Now let's assume in this particular crop that you are addressing this problem using uh, gypsum. Subsequently, and let's assume also, as in many of the soils, the magnesium uh, the, on the base saturation percentage is low. Um, you've accomplished what you set out to do by getting adequate magnesium release that it's going to be taken into the plant. Now you have to remedy this. You, you should continue for the next crop. Um, there needs to be a, 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 a remedy or an amendment to put about to address uh, the, the, the... This is where I think a lot of guys are missing the point. The magnesium that's not there in the base saturation needs to be addressed subsequently, doesn't it? To bring it up to a... Yes, <coughs> but probably what you will find is, I mean, if you don't put so much so much uh, uh, gypsum on that you bury the magnesium okay. in the inner layers okay. with too much calcium, and I think this may be what... what uh, Neil Kinsey does because mm -hmm. he's a mineral man, mm -hmm. and he doesn't he doesn't uh, he doesn't enter the soil biology into his mm -hmm. uh, equations. Mm -hmm. What rates would you be putting on soil so that you don't bury? I judge it based on the sulfur in the gypsum, not the calcium. He's basing his calculations on the calcium. So he's applying things like two tons to the acre of gypsum. But two tons to the acre of gypsum has Jesus, so much awful sulfate awful. in it that it's, yeah, that it's way more than is necessary. How much sulf sulfur would you be putting on so if you're basing it on sulfur rates? Let's just say, because you have to analyze your gypsum and it's not all the same. Mm -hmm. But let's just say gypsum is 15% sulfur. And your calculation there, just this is a general rule of thumb. It probably has a little variation for any soil, but the, the calculation is 250 kgs of your supplement will give you the percent, like the percent sulfur in your gypsum, as parts per million. So if you've got 10 parts per million sulfur in your, uh, in your analysis and you're shooting for, let's say you've got a moderately heavy soil, 15 TBC, and so you're looking for around 35 to 40 parts per million sulfur in that soil, then you've got 10 so you want to get another, 25. yeah, 25 to 30 parts per million. If your gypsum is 15%, then for every 250 kg per hectare, you're going to raise it one. You're going to raise it 15 parts per million. So if you put 500 kg on, then you're maxing out on sulfur. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting a ton or two tons on, though you would max out at 500 kg per hectare. 
See what I'm saying? Okay. It's, okay. Incidentally, Timmy gives me these chromatograms, but this is beautiful. This is compost with biodynamic preparations, and this is without. You see how much difference in organization? You see, the organization is the life. Can you turn it this, this way? This is alive. Yeah, see? Oh, yeah. This one is alive. It had the preps in it. This one didn't have the preps in it, and it's nowhere nearly as complex and alive. And Not even close. This one doesn't have enough silica by half. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, it's got plenty of lime, but the lime isn't really all that that well balanced or organized. This one here, this would be the compost to use. If you saw the chromatogram of the compost, you wouldn't have any doubt what to use. Hmm. Hugh, for the recording's sake, can you also mention uh, tons per acre, not just key, well, just key figure, J, kg per just hectare? Figure that tons per, he per hectare, if you look at it in terms of kilograms per hectare, just, it's, it's a rough calculation, but it's close to accurate that it's pounds per acre. Mm. Kilograms per hectare, just, just right in there, pounds per acre. So if in, in American tons, then your uh, pounds is 2,000 pounds per ton. So you would put pounds per acre, and 1,000 pounds would be equivalent to a ton per hectare. And when the sulfur application, is this annually? Or it's just with, from the total testing that you see? This it? is, this, it's not the total test that you're basing this on. Okay. You're basing it on the soluble test. In your total test, you have a ratio in my soil tests between uh, nitrogen and sulfur and nitrogen and, and carbon. And uh, you're looking roughly for a 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio and a 6 to 1 uh, nitrogen to sulfur ratio. That means a 60 to 1 carbon to, to sulfur ratio. That's sort of your target, what you would think of as ideal. Now, some soils, the soil that Robbie sent me, was very close to those targets. But it's really common to see soils that are a long ways from those targets. And you may have to build sulfur into the total test over a period of a few years. But in terms of a one-off uh, correction, then you're just correcting from the soluble test. And this illustrates again the importance of putting life into the soil. And when we use humic acid, then we're feeding the life of the soil. When we use compost, we're feeding the life of the soil. If you used compost uh, extract uh, or anything like that. You're feeding the life of the soil. The concern in using something like compost tea is if there's nothing in the soil to support that life, you put the compost tea out and it's got all these live organisms, but they die. So that's why you put the clay into the compost so you have those. You put the clay into the compost so you humify the ingredients of the compost and you make them insoluble but available and then they're food and it's a lasting food supply. It would be true that you would put a compost extract for the soil because it's got the diversity and it's also got the food for the biology when it's going in there but your compost tea is more of a foliar spray so because it's, 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 you don't have the same diversity of, of biology but you have huge numbers and it's more of a protection and a foliage spray. So the, the difference between a tea and an extract would be, one would be a foliar spray and one would be like a soil drench. Uh, yeah, like, I don't know if I'd necessarily think of it as a foliar. Because, for instance, putting compost tea out, NEM and whatnot, you can put them on as a foliar, but 
you're really build, you're trying to build the soil biology. So in putting compost teas out, like a nitrogen fixing compost tea on an avocado orchard or a peach orchard or, or whatever, then it goes out in the irrigation and it's, it's going in the soil. It's not going on the foliage. And it's effective uh, be, by building the soil biology. But you have a plant there, and you do this in pasture, you have a plant that's feeding the soil. Yeah. Mm. So you have something that's feeding the soil. I mean, hopefully it's feeding the soil. Out here in Ireland on rainy days, there may not be enough photosynthesis to really, like, feed the soil. On, like, dark and rainy days, what's happening sometimes is the, the <coughs> life of the soil is actually feeding off the human. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then on bright sunny days where you've got really good photosynthesis and the plant is pumping plenty of root exudates into the soil, then it builds humus. So your extract would be the more preferred way of, of putting on compost as such, and if you're putting it in a liquid form? Well, would yeah, the good? extract is because it's so nice and concentrated, mm -hmm. and this would be true if you're getting earthworm leachate, out of, say, earthworm tubs, then you're getting the pretty much the same thing as compost extract. Mm. And it's really useful for planting solutions, for liquid inject on top of your seed and the seed drill. Uh, it's really useful for that, but it's, it's almost too precious, you might say, to use as a broad-scale fertilizer as in a soil drench. So you're making your soil drench with such things as humic acid with a little bit of fulvic and molasses and that sort of thing. Because you were saying that you used to have like um, two different bathtubs basically with your one castings and your composting in there and you just put put water through it and, and leave it come out and just and, and then got it gather it up and then put it on your on your on Right, your you have a bucket under the drain yeah. and then you take those buckets when you're uh, transplanting or when you're sowing seed. Or putting boron out with it. <clears throat> yeah, you can add a little boron to it. And uh, There's also a recipe in my book for making uh, potassium silicate uh, soil, you know, amendment. So uh, a liquid potassium silicate, and that'll have boron in it. Uh, that's part of the formula. But you take, you could take the wood ashes from anything that's really highly siliceous, and uh, well, we found that the sugar cane bagasse in the sugar mill that was burned to generate heat and electricity, then that was a really good potassium silicate source. But you might, uh, you might find that if you burned horsetail, if you dried horsetail and burned that, that you'd get a really good potassium silicate out of it. What, what, and so, so the difference between, say, the ash, or if you were just trying to make uh, char out of it, so you, you, you try and burn it under the private auction conditions, which would be, a per, is there a difference in terms of which would prefer in terms of an ash or, say, a char? If I was making a char, I'd like to make it out of bamboo. It would be one of the best uh, biochars. Hmm. Uh, but in terms and, of the and just, the just for practical measures, let me say, split your bamboo first because otherwise it's like cherry bombs in your... Uh, Sounds like guns going off when we burn yeah. the bamboo on his farm. Yeah, if you build a bonfire and just throw the bamboo on, well then you get a real firework to display. But would you prefer, what you think is better in terms of quality, if it's uh, um, the wood ash or... or the well, well, for farms? making a... Uh, uh, potassium silicate solution, you need to turn it to the ash. If you want biochar, then then you don't. So what would you use the biochar for then, like if you were? Uh, biochar is great stuff, and you could put it in your compost, or you can spread it on the surface of the soil, and it'll get worked in. And I've, like, I've done experiments with it, and you can see the improvement of growth. It's really like, 
putting up hotels for your microorganisms. Would you inoculate it? Because like a lot of times you say that it is it is a home, and if it if it doesn't have if it doesn't have anything in it, it'll it'll yeah. suck suck out from all the nutrients. And yeah, what'll happen if you make a biochar is you're going to have your pyrolysis gases coming off mm -hmm. as you, you as you cook it. And those pyrolysis gases will have your nitrogen and, and sulfur and the, the, the things that are volatilizing. If you can bubble that through water, you get a sort of a pyrolysis gas vinegar. And then you would soak your biochar in that vinegar. This is an old alchemical practice. The alchemists used to do something very similar. So you want to capture that gas? So if you can capture that <coughs> gas when you're making biochar, that's probably the best possible thing you can charge your biochar with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how much biochar would one put? Because doesn't it just bring carbon to the soil? Well, yeah, but the way that it brings carbon to the soil is you've still got the carbon skeleton, but you stripped off all of the adjuncts to it. You've stripped off the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the, the uh, uh, sulfur. You've stripped that off. And now you put it back in a form that is food for those microbes. And you've got the hotel and it's got a, a really good food court in it. Well, why does biochar protect ash against chalara? Say that again. Why does biochar protect ash trees against um, chalara? What is chalara? It's the it's the ash dieback disease. Which oh, is so fungal, you've which got an fungal. ash blight of some sort. Yeah. And and biochar uh, protects those trees. On a program I saw in in Britain, they pumped biochar around one little patch of ash. The rest of the field died. And that patch was perfect. Well, but they actually pumped it in, and they were saying, which I thought was a quite a intensive way to do it. Yeah, I don't know just what they did, but uh, you can imagine though that that would feed the soil biology. It, it would establish soil biology that was beneficial to the tree. And chances are, and especially if it was made, if the biochar was something that was highly siliceous, and the ash tree, uh, it's a good straight grain tree. And it's really hard. And I would have to say it's a good, it's got a really good silica content mm. to it. And if it needs that, then it probably needs that to fight off the blight. And if you had, uh, even if the biochar was made out of ash, then it would be fairly high silica. Hickory would be really good. Hickories, when you make charcoal out of hickory, I don't know if you have hickory in these parts. Oh, well, it's, it's, we have it in, in the Appalachians. And it makes the best axe handles, and boy, when you burn it and make charcoal, it clinks like glass. It's oh boy. When you're saying charcoal, though, or char, like it, when you, I think we need to make a distinguish. When we're when you're making it, it's just char, and there's no, it's not biochar. It's just char until you actually put the biology into it. Then it's then it becomes biochar. Yeah, well, because also if you're going to use it as biochar, you have to crush it up. You have to grind it up because it. because you put big lumps of charcoal out there, and you're not going to get such a good effect. No. I bought Hugh a special screen. It takes all of everything we burn. It gets through that screen and gets put out on the soil. It's just a miner's, like, uh, you know, for taking samples. Some, someone that's a fossicker goes out and, you know, digs up gravel in the stream and sees what's in it and washes it, and the screen would do that. But uh, <clears throat> it's useful for sifting my wood ashes out on uh, my garden because uh, everything goes through the wood heater then that's the ash is something that's beneficial for the garden 
but you put it out in shovelfuls and it's toxic. You sift it out as a very light dusting, then it's beneficial. So, so in spreading ashes, that's what the shabri is talking about. But uh, and it, of course, it it keeps the charcoal. And then you can rake that charcoal aside and crush it up, and you've got uh, something you can make biochar out of. Because um, a lot of times when you make the biochar, it's a lot of dust in the air, and you want to be careful with that. And the other thing you want to do is, like, you potentially could use if you got the char and you've got some really good compost, make make an extract and and put that and dampen it down with the extract. Yeah, compost extract would be great to charge your biochar yeah. with. Just so could just have a paste uh, and just put it in there and fill it up and leave it in a, in a in a in a trough or something. Just leave it there. Yeah, you could just take a bathtub and do that. Yeah. Uh, but on an ongoing basis in a farm situation, the ideal way is put it in the bedding. Put it in with your compost. Yeah. Put it in with your yeah. Put it in your bedding. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you if you've got yeah. animals in the barn and uh, you know you'd also like uh, scatter some clay over that bedding and as you keep building the layers I mean uh, one of the tricks is to scatter some corn in that bedding and then when you get ready to muck it out you turn the pigs in there and then they make it pretty easy to shovel out after they've been through it. Mm -hmm. uh, so and you put your rock dust as we said before. As well. Yeah you'd put your rock dust, you'd put your biochar, you'd you do all of that. So potentially if you it's had... like, even though it isn't composted when you muck it out, mm. it's a whole lot closer to being composted. So potentially if you had your uh, total test and you were lacking in some, some stuff, you could potentially put that into your bedding and, huh. and, and get, it, get, it in, get it through that so you're making some good compost that's going to be addressing those, those, um, those, those deficiencies in your, in your test. Yeah, look, in the bedding, I would stir up some barrel compost, or in Australia we call this cowpad pit, and I'd, you know, I'd sprinkle down the bedding before I ever mucked it out, you know. Don't wait until the last minute to put your biodynamic preparations in it. I mean, look at the difference, see? <coughs> With preparations, without preparations. I mean, which would you prefer? You put it while the animals are there? Sure, mm -hmm. sure. In fact, I've seen sick animals that the best remedy for them is biodynamic preparations. I've seen sick calves that I treated radionically with barrel compost and 500, and they got up and they had an appetite and they started thriving. I put some of that in the water. Mm. Chase organics. Oh, you did? I do, yeah. 